Good evening and welcome to the November Volunteer Forum. We're coming to you live tonight from Ballarat Fire Station uh, here in District 15. As always, I'd like to start off the Volunteer Forum by acknowledging the Aboriginal lands to which we're all watching, celebrating and presenting to you here today and pay my respects 
to Aboriginal elders past and present and welcome any elders of other Aboriginal communities uh, to be with us uh, this evening. Another great jam-packed uh, tonight of uh, talking about training. Uh, I know it's been very topical, Jean. I know a lot of watchers out there have probably been waiting for you to come on and, and, and have this forum tonight. So um, I, I think there's going to be lots of discussion and lots of questions. It's been quite topical. So. Uh, it's basically all about training uh, this evening. We have a lot of uh, other questions that we will get to, and as usual, um, we have the live chat uh, running this evening. So if you do have any questions, whether it be training related or, or otherwise, please feel free uh, to put the, your question in the chat. Uh, as always, uh, to begin with, tell us where you're from. And I actually would like to uh, start out by giving a special little shout out uh, this evening to Sandra Ince, who I notice uh, is her first time watching and welcome uh, to the CFA, new to our organisation in Wyndham Vale. So thank you for watching this evening and I hope you're having a fantastic time uh, here with the CFA. A big shout out to our live audience this evening and can I uh, especially thank Mark Cutledge from uh, Captain of Ballarat Brigade for allowing us to come into uh, this fantastic station, this historical station. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, about that along with other members of District 15, welcome uh, all. And likewise, I'm sure many of you will also ask the hard questions of, of Jean and Rowan, I am sure. Joining me on the panel this evening, uh, I have Deputy Chief Officer Rowan Luke uh, from Southwest Region. Welcome, Rowan. Good evening, Chief. We have uh, Deputy Chief Officer Jean Diesel, uh, who needs no introduction. Uh, our DCO for Operational Doctrine and Training, very popular deputy. We have uh, uh, Ian Cosby, uh, leading firefighter with Fire Rescue Victoria. It was with CFA. It was, um, yes. You're also a, you're an instructor yep. with, with CFA, uh, a volunteer, an ex-captain, and a member of Bunninglong. So a man of many hats. Uh, thank you for coming along this Thanks, evening. Chief. It's, it's fantastic to have you uh, on the panel here tonight. And we have Bill Cook, uh, another a deputy group <laughs> officer, uh, but a former ex-captain as well from Sebastopol Brigade. Yes. And uh, you're a volunteer uh, trainer and assessor. So yes. yep. thank you for, for coming on this evening as well. And uh, again, I'm pretty sure there's probably going to be a few questions coming to, uh, to both of you this evening. Look uh, forward to it. <laughs> uh, I'm sure around training and, uh, and how it all comes to be. Uh, online, we have many of our senior managers uh, across CFA ready to answer your questions. So if I don't get to your questions this evening still, please feel free to put it into the chat. Uh, our friendly team are online and will try and answer as many as they can uh, to, uh, to uh, get to as many as we can. Ian, Hello. fantastic facility we're in. And I say fantastic in as far as the history. The, the, the walls just ooze history in this place. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about it? So um, we're in the, the heart of one of CFA's oldest stations. In fact, it's one of the oldest um, continually operating stations in Australia, if not in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, it was actually staffed by career staff up until 1983 mm -hmm. when they blended with Ballarat City. Wow, so, so. A, a, absolutely phenomenal. And I know many probably can't see, or uh, on the screen there, you can see one of the many trophy cabinets there, but there's just the, the brigade has had such a rich history with running, with events, uh, and with firefighting here yes. in, uh, in Western Victoria. Absolutely. Some of the, some of the trophies, um, we had some at Ballarat City also, and they, were, they tried to appraise them and they were classed as priceless. I have no, uh, no doubt at all. Uh, and um, I'm sure many are watching this evening thinking, wow, that's an interesting piece behind us. Um, we have a, a, an old Dodge truck here behind us. So what can you tell us about it? So it's a, a 1943 Dodge Pumper. Um, it was actually stationed here at Ballarat Brigade and lovingly restored by the members for one of their milestones. In particular, a shout out should go to uh, Stan Neeshaw, who was a member in excess of 65 years, who has just recently passed. And he also used to work at our CFA when they owned the workshops in Ballarat and was instrumental in many, many trucks. And I think he was um, also hand-painted part of this one. And if anyone remembers the Pink Panther fire trucks, they used to be painted in a, a paint called We Deluxe, which was like day glow orange and that was one of his specialties um, so yeah very very honored to have this piece of history behind us and also the memories of the man absolutely and i know mark and the crew here at uh, ballarat fire brigade lovingly look after it and take it out often to, to shows and events 
uh, and they really are doing a fantastic job at, at keeping the, the history, the tradition, the culture uh, of Absolutely. CFA alive. So uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you to the members of the, of the Ballarat Brigade. Well, Jean, it is about you tonight. It is about training your team uh, and many across the uh, across the, the state. So when I first uh, came into CFA, uh, people would remember the Chiefs tour and I, uh, a lot of conversation raised by brigades at that time around um, training and some of the challenges that our members uh, were having with training. And, but not only some of the challenges, also some of the great stuff that we are doing in the training um, space as well. So uh, one of the things that I did give my commitment to very early on was uh, undertaking a, a review of training uh, and by get, bringing in AFACS, the Australian uh, Australasian Fire Emergency Services Council, uh, to do a bit of a peer review and training. And the reason for that was post fire, seizures, fire services reform, uh, yeah, we were a very different CFA. Um, yeah, the, the, the government had turned us into a, a, a primarily volunteer Absolutely. fire emergency services supported by uh, career staff from both CFA and FR, FRB. Um, and it was about making sure that our contemporary uh, offering for training was uh, and does continue to meet the needs uh, of, of our volunteers. So uh, it had a couple of recommendations, and I know we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit uh, this evening. But um, Jean, I guess for many out there, uh, some might not know who you are, where you're from. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your history and, uh, and how you got to be involved in, in training and adult education? Mm. Thank you, Chief, and good evening to everybody at home and everybody in the audience here. It is a pleasure to be here, and I'm sure we'll have some robust discussions tonight and some very big questions. Um, there's not too much about me. I'm quite a boring person. Um, I love education and training and have been working in it for many years. So my background is anything in relation to public safety, and I've been working alongside military, alongside police, alongside other public safety agencies for probably more than about close to about three decades now. Very happy to have joined the CFA. In fact, it's, it's the one area that I'm not that familiar with in terms of, of fire. So I have learned through a trial by fire about what training means within CFA. And I think uh, if I may just offer this observation, training seems to be very deeply felt within the CFA. People are very uh, passionate about their training. They have different opinions about their training. They have different views about their training. And I must say, when you have that kind of passion, everything else in terms of issues are resolvable as long as you've got a membership that supports training. And I certainly have felt that training has been supported by every single member within the CFA. And um, one of the things about CFA and our training offering is we are a registered training organisation yes. uh, to provide uh, nationally accredited um, public safety training packages and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the adult vocational education. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it means to be an RTO and I guess some of the things that we need to do? And the reason why I ask that is uh, Don asked us this evening, does CFA need to be an RTO? I believe that most voles don't need formal qualification and it simply seems to create artificial blocks to providing training and skills. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Chief. It's probably the question that I get asked the most as I work my way through <coughs> different districts and speaking to different brigades. Um, there are distinct benefits in being an RTO, but there's also compliance matters that come with alongside with being an, an RTO. So I guess the primary three uh, benefits of being an RTO is first and foremost, we are training to an industry agreed standard. And I think nobody should underestimate how important that is when you are working in public safety, in circumstances where your own personal safety is put at risk, the colleague next to you's safety is put at risk and the community's um, safety is put at risk. So the ability to train to a standard and know that everybody on your team has met the same industry agreed standard is really important in training. So that's probably the first reason why I think it's a good idea for us to maintain our RTO status. Secondly, it allows us to be interoperable. So we get to work alongside other public safety agencies um, when there are particular events such as the recent floods. Uh, they know that we've been trained to a good standard. They know that we can work alongside them and that's really important. And I, then I think from a personal point of view, it is important particularly for the volunteers that give up their time and their effort and time with family and their personal time and commitment that we give them the assurances that they have transferable skills. 
And without being an RTO and without receiving a statement of attainment, it's very difficult for any volunteer to prove and provide evidence that they actually have transferable skills. Now, I'm sure there's some members out there that would say right about now, um, but we've tried to have members transfer from other <laughs> fire services and other yes. jurisdictions. So uh, we've had that, that chat, haven't we, Jean? So, yes. um, but it is, it, whilst we are dealing uh, and fixing with some of those um, uh, challenges that we have in getting it through the system. Um, it is important that we do have that national, I think, because it, it is supposed to be as simple as being able to move from one area to another, from one jurisdiction Correct. to another, one fire service to another. Uh, and then all that's left, I guess, is that contextualisation of what it means to operate within that, uh, within that organisation mm -hmm. environment, isn't it? Yep. That's actually very well explained. Can I say, Chief? Excellent. Well explained. <laughs> it's, uh, that's, the, that's the former trainer in me. Um, Ian, Bill, uh, I'm betting you're biased, but that's okay. How important is training? And I think from your perspective, Ian, uh, you're, you're a career firefighter. Um, yes. How important is it to be able to have that interoperability and that uh, ability to know that we yeah, meet the same standards or at least have that level of competence? Um, I, I can only echo what um, yourself and the deputy said that interoperability is key and if we can transfer a person's competency across fire services and across other emergency mm -hmm. services agency and then just in layman's terms CFAIs it to suit our operability then it has to be beneficial for the whole emergency service organisation across the nation and in fact interstate. Um, for example we've had a couple of um, New Zealand fire service people that have come across and they, everyone puts out fires, we all do it the same way. We might just use different branches or hoses or couplings, but um, all in all, I think it's very important that we're all singing from the same hymn book. Mm -hmm. And Bill, from your perspective? Um, if, thanks, Chief. Uh, and Jean touched on the earlier, uh, and that, and that skills base works through. So I know that uh, Cross has got the same skills that I have and just builds that, um, that, that trust in the knowledge that everyone's trained and knows what they're doing, uh, being on multiple, you know, strikes in, uh, strikes in from other areas, you know that these people, uh, are, we're all at the same standard. Yeah. Yep. And it's not about <clears throat> um, making sure everyone's trained exactly the same, like robots, you know, no. across all agencies. Like, right. And it's just that's not reasonably um, practical, but it is about those foundational skills. skills absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yep. And being able to apply those, those foundational skills across. Um, Jean, another question for, uh, for yourself. Uh, and Grayson asks, how come CFA can't seem to line courses up with other agencies such as chainsaw courses? Hmm. There's actually no reason for us not to be able to do that. But it is about um, all of the impacting factors. So for example, do we use the same equipment? Do we train in the same way? Can we as an RTO uh, bounce off the fact that they have registered trainers and assessors and accredita accredited trainers and assessors? So it's about making sure that all of those compliance features are similar with your partner agency and that you've got a proper MOU in place. So I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, Chief, but if I may, when you share training material as an example, there's all sorts of, of sort of legal factors that impact that. So for example, who does the package actually belong to if you share it? Who does the intellectual property belong to? If, if that particular organisation changes the package and they don't let you know, what does that mean for you as an agency still using that training package? So there's actually a fair amount of work that has to be done to do that properly and to facilitate that sharing. But in general, that's certainly something that I think we can look at. And um, Rowan, particularly, uh, one of the things that Natalie and myself did fairly on in our tenure was, I guess, do some executive functional realignments, mm -hmm. um, particularly across service delivery. Uh, I did the same thing in terms of creating, you know, operational doctrine and training. But one of the other things I did was uh, put uh, managers learning and development uh, yep. and training delivery uh, in, the, in the regions, uh, in, underneath the uh, regional deputies. How's that working for you? So I think it is an improvement, uh, Chief. The, um, so the MLDs report directly to the DCOs, but form part of the regional leadership team. So if we think about um, the headquarters based team that work directly with Jean about developing, you know, the policy around the training, the, the packages, the um, uh, RTO requirements, so set the framework, the delivery of training really sits within the region as part of service delivery. So to have the MLDs report directly to the DCOs, I think has been an advantage. Um, what it's done is enable 
Probably some more robust conversations with the MLDs and DCOs around training plans. And we've still got a bit more work to go, but um, you know, there's been, been some significant focus about trying to get the right training program set that support the ACFOs in delivering services through their brigade. So um, that relationship with the ACFO is as important as the DCO to identify what needs to be delivered, what the priorities are, and allow the MLDs to deliver that with the instructors and the, the team within the um, learning and development. Absolutely. So, Jean, uh, lots of questions flowing in, I, you know, as I'm sure you've, you, you've seen. Um, let's go to some of the hard ones, um, because that's what we do on the, the volunteer forum. We don't duck the hard ones. So, a lot of commentary around um, course cancellations. I know yes. uh, we've had conversations around that, and a lot of people sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, yeah, let, let us know what their, their thoughts and feelings of that uh, is. Can you talk to us through, I guess, um, what you found and what, what are you thinking in terms of um, course scheduling into the future? Thank you, Chief. Course cancellations, certainly I can understand the frustration that goes with putting aside time, registering for a course, you know, putting up your hand and then the course being cancelled. But I think it is important to distinguish between the different types of courses. So the, pri the, the, um, the largest amount of courses currently are being scheduled through the MLDs. Um, as Rowan's just indicated there. So it's really important to understand that at times, not all of the planets align for those regional courses to go ahead. So for example, we need to make sure that we've got an instructor available. We need to make sure that the training material is available. We need to make sure we're required that the equipment is available. We need to make sure that we've got enough students to actually viably run the course. And all of those planets need to align for the course to, to go ahead. But I did want to just indicate that there's certain courses that are not exclusively run by the regions. So if you have any issues in terms of those courses, it's really important that you work with OD and TN and my team to, to facilitate those courses. And that um, encompasses first aid training, so that's courses we run, the specialist response courses we run, and some of the driver training courses we run as well. I think in terms of course cancellations, it's been severely impacted. We did a little bit of a trend study over October. Uh, definitely impacted via the floods and, and some of the deployments that occurred there. But we are hoping that in November it's starting to ramp up again. The deputies, myself and the chief, are now monitoring course cancellations every month. And we're hoping to understand what the trends are and what the reasons are for those course cancellations to be able to remove them and to have more courses available for volunteers. So talking about course availability and the like, uh, I know you, the team have been working very hard in transitioning our training packages from the PUA 12 to PUA 19. Um, can you tell us what has been released so far and what's in the pipeline? Yes, I have a list. So I'll just work you through that. I think um, in general, we've got over 200 training packages, which is a lot of training packages to manage, lots of training courses there. And every package has, as you all know, it's got an assessor, a, you know, a skills pack for an assessor, skills pack for, for, the, um, for the student. It's got a reference manual. It's got PowerPoints. It's got so much material that sits behind every single one of those 200 courses. So to review them and to review them properly takes a fair bit of time. And I'm of the opinion that I'd like to do this properly. I do not want to review or develop a course. And once we've released it, we get a lot of complaints about the course. So we're actually starting to front load the consultation around those courses to make sure that we talk to the right people about the course content before the course is released. But in direct response to your question, Chief, uh, we have released this year so far the rescue saw training package, that handover is in place now. We, we're doing the handover for tree hazard assessor, which I know has been a, a really big request from the volunteers. The hazmat operator course has been released. The operate BA open circuit classic has been released. General rescue has been released. Um, and fire investigation, which I'm really proud of. Can I just say all of the really good work that people like Nicole Harvey and Teresa Lloyd have done on fire investigation under, under Gary Cook, really. So that's all been released. What we are about to work on. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has finally happened after <laughs> all these months of doing uh, the volunteer forum at Fire Brigade and Stations. Ballarat is the first one uh, to have a job uh, fair and match smack bang in the middle of it. So we'll give them a couple of seconds to uh, get their bells and whistles down the road. And uh, I, think we're, I think we can just uh, hear them fade out now. So back over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. 
we are about to embark working on crew leader, strike team leader, sector commander, respond to urban, which we know there's a really big request for. And then some of the other courses we're going to look at is our courses like Fire Weather One, definitely driving. That seems to be a really big request from most of our volunteers. And we're also looking at reviewing certain parts of the general firefighter now that it's been rolled out. And we've got some feedback on those courses. So that's what's in the pipeline. Awesome. Um Bill, a question for you, if I may, because um, I'm interested in the volunteer voice mm -hmm. uh, and what, and what you, you think about uh, this one. Uh, question with CFA still using paid instructions, instructors such as Crossy, um, where do VTA sit, so volunteer trainers and assessors uh, sit? Uh, will CFA make sure, and I guess how have CFA sure, be making sure that uh, our volunteer trainers and assessors get opportunity to teach their endorsed subjects uh, and maintain their skills? So. What's your thoughts to that and, your, and I guess your thoughts and feelings? That's a really great question and um, <clears throat> speaking from our, uh, our region here, just 15, um, we are one unit. There's no derision of, of, of it across, he wears a uniform, I wear a different uniform, but we both deliver the same course, we both deliver together uh, and the standard is the same that, that we get from, from, from each of us or from the whole team, whether they be uh, paid staff or, or volunteers. We, we deliver the same courses together, uh, and we really, yeah, we're, we're a really good tight unit. So I'm really proud of that, that that synergy and that, and that um, I guess, friendship and understanding of where each other come from. Uh, it, it does work very well here, and I hope it's just the same across the state. Absolutely, um, gentlemen. What's the most popular course that uh, that people ask you to instruct on? Probably general mm. firefighter at the moment. Yeah. Um, it always seems to be uh, everyone wants to become a firefighter before mm. flammer, and and it usually goes absolutely nuts if we're if we're fronting up to a bad fire season. Um, they all of a sudden they need backsize on seats really really quickly. So a lot of our time um, is spent this time of year doing general firefighter, chainsaw operator, that sort of thing, and the driving courses. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, Jean, some, a lot of questions in here, a lot of discussion, and, and Ian, likewise for yourself, uh, around the structural firefighter training. I know you've, you, you know, you've, you've touched on releases of packages and that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, it is a course that we know our people have been really calling out for. Um, so I guess where are we at with mm. you know, structural training and, uh, and also, I guess, structural skills maintenance mm. as well? Thank you, Chief. Um, at this point in time, we are still working to transition um, the units of competency for that particular course from PUA 12 to PUA 19. And can I just say that the change between PUA 12 and PUA 19 is quite significant. And one of the really small changes that they made that has resulted in a huge amount of work for the team reviewing the courses is around actually changing the range of conditions to you may use some of this to you must use. And in just that one change of word, it now means that we have to train in almost more types of equipment. Um, there's, there's more elements that we have to train to. So it has made it a bit more complex. And that's the reason why it's taking some time for us to, to roll that out. But it is important that we are compliant. Um, we, we have recently done our re-registration audit and it really brought back home for me the importance of our compliance, ensuring that we do deliver to that industry standard. So we don't get to choose what we'd like to deliver or not deliver when we've made the decision that that would be aligned to a national unit of competency. And it's in that transition for us that there's a fair bit of, of work. Mm -hmm. But I do want to say, Chief, that that is normal. It, it's not CFA specific. So my, my background in many ways goes back to policing and we had exactly the same. When you transition from one version of a training package to, to the next, there is bound to be this transition sort of pain that you feel in trying to develop and realign the training packages. Absolutely. Uh, another question, uh, and again, um, Bill, I'm keen yep. to your, hear your thoughts on this, but a uh, question here from Don. As an RTO, the impost on volunteer trainers is significant. To maintain currency as a Cert 4 TAA every four years or spend significant time obtaining the Diploma yep. of Education, hundreds and hundreds of hours. Uh, Jean, your thoughts to that? That is correct. That is correct. Um, and can I say again, it's a pain not just felt by the CFA. Every single public safety agency whether it's ACS, Victoria Police, and so forth, all struggle 
to allow their trainers and assessors to maintain the skills and competencies required in the Certificate 4 in Training and Assessment. It's a very big issue nationally, mm -hmm. and I know that there's been several attempts at the federal government level to try and ensure that that particular certificate doesn't change so often and that the impost in it isn't so big. Mm -hmm. But I do agree with that. It is a significant amount of time for our volunteer trainers and assessors. And, and I guess that's that's part of the frustrations, isn't yes. it? Not only within yes. CFA, but also across the board, as you say, across Correct. the sector. And I know it's discussed at AFAC level as well. And, uh, and as you said, that every now and then the, at that federal level, they tweak something which then results in you know, hundreds, thousands mm. uh, of, of instructors needing to, to, to change that. Um, if you have the diploma, it's mm. less, because I think once you get the diploma, then it's, it, you know, there's less changes to it. Correct. But you know, as, as you know, was pointed out, that's a lot of effort and a lot of time mm. as well. Mm. Um, now, I also noticed in the, in the chat there, there was some conversation around the costs associated with obtaining uh, Cert 4 in, in training. Um, now, we, we had a bit of a program going, and I think it might be still going around um, getting that Cert 4 and getting our people up to speed on that. Is that right? Mm. So we've actually had a program, I think, for about 20 of our trainers and assessors to undertake the, the diploma. So to actually move and transition from the certificates through to the diploma. But in general, a lot of the competencies aligned to the certificate for in training and assessment, that budget has now been divulged through to the regions. So it's actually your MLDs that you need to be talking to, to try and access some of the funding to support you. Mm -hmm. So you've been getting a, a bit of a grilling here this evening, uh, Jean, so far, <laughs> but it might be Rowan's turn. So Rowan, Southwest region. Um, so what are your thoughts, I guess, in upskilling and maintaining skills for, for volunteer trainers and assessors. Thanks, <coughs> Chief. The, um, <coughs> excuse me. I see our trainers and assessors having the same level of importance as our Level 3 incident controllers. Mm. So we invest in our Level 3 incident controllers to get to the, the mark that they need to reach to be able to deliver incident control across all hazards. And the same with our trainers and assessors. And I think, we're, again, we've got a bit of work to do, and I know there's some things starting to occur. You know, I can talk about some of the things in South West, for example, but um, that level of um, skill and qualification around the important role that trainers and assessors do need that level of support. Um, and I think there are some similarities in how we support incident controllers to how we could support our trainers and assessors into the future. Um, you know, workshop style, you know, coming together, um, you know, common discussions around developing programs and, and uh, sequencing availability of trainers and assessors to make sure that, you know, they're active in the work they do is really important. Because there's no point, same as an incident controller, if you're an incident controller but you never get a call, um, you know, you're not going to do it for long. And we need to make sure that our trainers and assessors, you know, have opportunities to deliver training no different than other roles. Mm. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Rowan. Uh, Ian, a <coughs> question for, for you. Um, so, uh, a question here is, why is CFA providing skill packs that don't even have the correct information? A close instructor friend of mine has to change the stuff and tell the students that they are different. Um, we rely on our government's team to give us skills packs that are accurate and compliant. Um, instructors and trainer assessors no longer have access to them for that very reason. They are controlled documents, they are a legal document, they are a legal requirement and hence that's why they're so closely guarded and all I can say is if there's any instructors or TAs out there that are, that are changing skill packs and the import of the skills packs then they may not be compliant and unfortunately the participants may not actually get the competencies. Mm. So I would caution against that very strongly. Some wise, some wise words there. And I guess if there are <coughs> identified problems with skills, packs, courses, that sort of stuff, who's the best person, uh, or where can people send that mm. information through to, to get that looked at, Jean? Thank you, Chief. To the training mailbox. It's very simple. There's a, there's a training mailbox set up. So any continuous improvements, if you pick up something as small as an error, uh, a spelling error, if you pick up something really major that, that's incorrect, please let us know. We're happy to put that onto a continuous improvement register and make those changes. Of course, if the change uh, might affect safety, the change needs to be made immediately. Absolutely. Uh, one for you again, Rowan. Uh, Alyssa asks, regions need to support so they can t in turn roll out community engagement training to our brigades across the state for the benefit of our communities. 
Uh, I guess, what are your thoughts to you know, that community engagement training and the need to roll it out? So I agree. Um, it, it is important that we have people delivering community engagement within the community at the, at the same standard. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, for Gene's team is um, the primary focus is in the operational response priorities at the moment. Um, so it's probably lagging a little bit behind, but I also appreciate there's a really strong team of um, community engagement, community safety teams within the regions that can support one-on-one -on -one to help deliver those programs and, and mentors. So yes, I think it's important. Um, the challenge is there's a lot of things that are trying to be rolled out at the moment and where it sits in that priority sometimes is really difficult. Um, so Bill, I understand a few weeks ago, uh, your district ran a session for aspiring uh, trainers and assessors. Yep. Can you tell me more about it? Um, yeah, it was, excuse me. <clears throat> As we said earlier, um, we've got a, a group where both the uh, instructors and, and trainer assessors meet regularly, uh, and we've identified that we want to build on that base of particularly the trainer assessors. So we held a night down at uh, Balan, and there were, I think it was about uh, 25 odd people that uh, come along for the night, and uh, we, we both all, all shared our experiences and were able to uh, answer the questions they had. A very positive f feedback from the members attending. Um, and we've got some really, um, some really great t people that are keen. And I know there's a few of them in the audience tonight, you can't see them, but there's a number of people in the audience tonight who are, who are stepping up to take on those roles. So they're very keen to, to uh, expand the team and, and what we're able to deliver for our members. Mm -hmm. Um, so, from, from experience for both of you, and also I guess, you know, Jean and Rowan, what is, uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We're not shying away from that, and you've been very upfront with some of the challenges and issues that we're, that we're facing. And I know one of the challenges that we have is uh, trainer and assessor availability. So there is a need for us to, to boost that, um, to boost that cohort. Because I think if we've got more numbers, mm. then it lightens the burden on on the few yes. that are actually doing that work, isn't it? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, so if anyone's sort of thinking about, you know, stepping into that training environment, becoming a, a trainer assessor, what sort of, who can they talk to? What's some of the advice that they might be able to get from at that local level? Probably start off talking with their, with their captain or the brigade management team, express their interest. And then uh, through the, through the, uh, the, the regions, the districts go uh, and approach your uh, learning development um, coordinators there and have a chat with them and, and express your interest that, that way. Awesome. So <coughs> that's in the volunteer space, but I understand, Ian, also within ODT, uh, we're starting to do some professional development programs for yes. our, our, our trainers and assessors. Uh, can you tell me more? So um, I know there's been a, a very strong initiative by the ADT team to put some um, webinars up that we can log into and have a look at. Um, look at different topics, I believe on the 1st of December for uh, the instructor cohort, the career instructor cohort, there's a one on LL and N, so language literacy and, literacy and numeracy that we're looking forward to. And the, the forum that uh, Bill was referring to in, in West Region, we've got a group we call TORCOP, so training assessing is working code of practice, practice I believe yep. it is, and that's where- um, Another acronym, yeah. Yeah, another acronym, yet another acronym for safety. <laughs> um, that's where trainers and trainers, assessors and instructors can come together mm -hmm. with a common goal mm -hmm. to do that professional development and, and just basically chew the fat and make sure we're all on the same page. Awesome. Um, lots of conversation <coughs> and discussions around uh, how do I get into that training mm -hmm. space. So yeah, talk to your captain, talk to your district, but yep. I guess if all else fails, uh, feel free to send an email through to, to the training, training at CFA. Uh, .vic.gov.au and we'll point you in, uh, in the right direction because mm -hmm. uh, getting uh, a, a sustainable pool of trainers and assessors, mm -hmm. whether they be career or volunteer, uh, is how we're going to be able to sustain the training needs into the future. And I think the reality is uh, COVID has done us no favours. Uh, it effectively yeah. shut training down for probably mm -hmm. close to, to two years. years. Yep. Um, <clears throat> massive backlog of, of courses and then along came the need to transition training packages and the rest of it. So unfortunately for training, it's been a bit of a perfect storm, yes. uh, which has led to uh, a lot of the frustration of our members and we feel the frustration of our members. Uh, and you know, you've got a plan uh, to, to try to unplug 
unblock the, the drain, so to speak, so we can get the, the, get the training going and get those courses up and running. But I think it's, it is important that we acknowledge that there have been a number of external factors that have really contributed uh, to some of the frustrations that are leading to uh, our volunteers at the moment. I know many of our members have participated in the AFAC peer review, and I know I get questions from time to time about where are we up to with the AFAC peer review and what are some of the outcomes and when am I going to start to see some of the results uh, or some of the learnings uh, from that. Uh, we've asked the program manager to give a bit of an update on the AFAC peer review, so I'll throw to Brad to give us an update on where things are at. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, Jason. Hi, everyone. I'm Brad Adrianza. I'm the program manager for the AFAC peer review uh, project implementation, um, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So as you know, the AFAC project, uh, the report was accepted by the board and the executive uh, just over 18 months ago. Uh, part of implementation for all of the recommendations was establishing four working groups. The training framework working group, we have the governance working group, diversity and inclusion, and then operational capability. Each working group was set up with a convener um, with the specialization in each of those areas. And what we've done with the recommendations of the 14, we've grouped them according to their themes. So from May, um, we, have, we set up uh, different meetings for each of the working groups. Now, depending on the recommendations and the work that needed to be done, the frequency of those meetings uh, was slightly different. So for example, with the training framework working group, um, we, because the main, the, the, the recommendation that they focused on was developing a interim training uh, frame, uh, training pathway. So for that group, we set up a series of nine workshops. So they were meeting weekly where we heard from different um, subject matter experts in different domains that are using training pathways. So for example, we had presenters from aviation, forestry in industry brigades, uh, FEM, um, community engagement, uh, Vic SES, who, who, who shared how they are using training pathways. And we looked at what can we take from that experience and how can we apply those insights to the, to the de redevelopment of CFA's interim training pathways? So since April, um, the, we've, each of the, the governors in the training framework working group have met between 12 and, and 18 times. The diversity and inclusion working group, uh, we've had two initial meetings, but that group only really meets when they have proposals to review. So for that group, they don't have recommendations per se to look after. But what they do is they provide valuable, a valuable DNI assessment and sense check on all of the proposals and resolutions that the other working groups come up with to make sure that we're covering off, that we are covering all our bases from a diversity and inclusion perspective. Out of all those meetings, I guess the question would be, well, what have we done? And what, and what can we show for the work that's been done? So the, 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 two, the two working, well, three of the working groups have done quite a bit of work. I just want to talk about the operational capability working group. The recommendations that they're looking after there are adjacent projects that are underway at the moment that will, that will impact on what recommendations are developed for, for those three. So we have the brigade classification review, which is underway at the moment, and the BOSP review, which is underway. And there's a pending piece of work around skills maintenance. So those are the three recommendations that, that group looks after. So until those three adjacent projects are resolved and the outcomes are clear, there's not much that the group can do at the moment. So the bulk of the work has sat with the diversity and inclusion, with the governance and with the training framework working group. So for the governance group, their main focus has been on, on a recommendation that talks about the revitalization of the, of the volunteer train and assessor workforce. And within that, there are three different components. So one is around the management and leadership structure of, of the volunteer trainer assessor cohort, but more importantly, around how do we recognize the contribution and value of our volunteers who fulfill training roles. So that group has worked, uh, has put a lot of work in developing a proposal that, it, that begins to address some of those issues on, around recognition. The AFAC project has been interesting in that there are lots of other adjacent projects and other contextual influences that are impacting on, on what those resolutions would look like. So as the AFAC project manager and as the broader ODNT team, we've been able to feed back to the group and say these are developments or this is uh, policy thinking that will impact on, on these recommendations. This is some, these are some things for you to consider and what would a resolution look like taking all of these things in mind for these recommendations. So for the governance working group, they've actually gotten to the point where 
they've been able to come up with resolutions to present to the Project Control Board on almost all of their recommendations. For the Training Framework Working Group, out of the three recommendations that they have, um, two are fairly straightforward to resolve. The one that they've put a lot of work into is developing an interim operational training pathway, which as you'd appreciate is a big piece of work. So that group um, start, they, through a, a series of consultative workshops, they developed a first draft of that interim training pathway. We then conducted further consultation with, with other stakeholders to, to gather their input in, in further refining that training pathway. So that is a proposal and a, a, and a piece of work that will be presented to the Project Control Board um, on the 10th of December. So speaking about you know, the 10th of December, there's the Project Control Board presentation day where, all, where the working groups will have selected representatives who will present their group's resolutions as well as their group's proposals to the Project Control Board for discussion and consideration. Thank you everyone for your time. It's been a pleasure to be able to share with you an update on what's happening in the AFAC space. So thank you, Jason. Thanks for that update, Brad, and the information on where we're at with the AFAC peer review. And I look forward to uh, further updates and information as it becomes uh, available. Um, Ian, lots of chatter and lots of discussion about yes. the Dodge. I know a lot of people like seeing history, in particular old, uh, old fire trucks. So 1938, Dodge. Yes, I was I was wrong, Chief. The, the the captain of the local brigade got quite miffed at me, but I was told <laughs> that the 43 on the number plate, which confused me, is actually the brigade number. Oh, so I apologise. Now, you've got something very special in front oh, of you. I have. So originally when the Dodge um, was found again, it was actually owned by a gentleman by the name of Paul Jenkins, who happened to be the captain of Sebastopol at the time. And... Uh, Paul Jenkins tried to donate the Dodge to Ballarat Fire Brigade, but was unable to. So he actually sold the Dodge to them for a nominal fee of $1. And in this frame in front of me, I've actually got the very dollar which he promptly donated back to the brigade um, with a, a little plaque. So I might hold that up for the camera. Um, and that's how Ballarat Fire Brigade actually was able to retain or regain possession of the Dodge that you see behind us. Wow, absolutely amazing. So not only did they get a, uh, a truck, but they got their money back. They did, uh, money get well. guarantee. <laughs> that money back guarantee. <laughs> and it's, it's the sort of history that, uh, that keeps people sort of in, involved and engaged yes. and want to know more about, uh, about Fire Brigade, because Fire Brigade uh, has a very long uh, and honourable tradition, you know, dating right back, and as I said before, particularly uh, the CFA and as before we went live this evening we were watching uh, a slideshow and uh, you yes. commented on a few of those photos. I did. It. So there was um, uh, one with a, a, a two La France ladders which were um, parked out of the front of the station. Uh, there was also one with a, um, a manual fire appliance um, pulled by a lovely dapple grey horse and I actually asked if it was Larry which is a, a very famous horse that was up at Ballarat City Fire Brigade. Um, so yeah, there's just lots of history. And this used to be known as Ballarat East and we're only about 100 yards from where the Ballarat East Town Hall was. So, yeah. Well, and interestingly enough, and also you know, people can't see it, but you've still got the Chaff House out the side here. Um, I believe so, yes. Uh, the, the tower is still intact um, and there is a, a twin tower that was the old Ballarat City Fire Station up in Sturt Street. It's now a a real estate agent, I believe now, but um, that was how they used to look out over the, the city and um, see where the fires were, well, well before Esther and Triple O and all the rest of it. Yeah, well, no, thanks for, thanks for filling mm. us in there. As I said, a lot of interest. Um, yeah. And uh, if, if you are uh, travelling around and do happen to come past uh, Ballarat Fire Station and the roller doors are up, the doors open, I do encourage you to pop in, say good day to the crew and have a look at some of the history in this place uh, and let them tell this, you the story of the Ballarat Fire Brigade because it is something uh, that is very special to CFA and Victorian communities. Uh, Jane, back on to training. Yes, thank you. Uh, USI, what is it and why is it important? Mm. So the USI is, is just an acronym for the Unique Student Identifier, which allocates a number to every single student that you are supposed to carry with you for life. 
which means that all of your training records are updated and, and you carry those training records against that number. It's that unique identifier. It is quite interesting because when the USI came, came about a few years ago, there were actually some of the public safety agencies that didn't want a USI. So for example, in police, there was a huge campaign because human source and undercover operatives couldn't have a USI because that would be allocated against, for example, your date of birth and, and where you were living and so forth. But in general, the federal government has, has signed off on the USI. So currently, if you are an RTO, um, that's been accredited by ASQA as, as the regulator that takes care of most of the states and territories within Australia, then you must allocate an USI. But for the state of Victoria, that still uses the VRQA, and for WA, that still uses the TAC Council, we are not required yet to have a USI. But I know that there's a, a significant piece of work underway currently with the manager of the LMS to have a look at what are the possibilities for us in future with our vendor that actually supports the LMS to introduce a USI for all of our students. Excellent, thank you. And that's a, a great piece of information, particularly around the nuances between Victoria and Western Australia um, and the other states and territories under, under ASQA. Uh, another question here from Don. Uh, where are we at with driving courses, drive on road, drive off road? Uh, he's had members waiting for, for near 18 months. Yes. And Don, look, I, I wish I could say to you it's going to happen overnight, but the truth is it, it won't. So I'll just take you back a step here. For us, it's really about ensuring that we've got proper doctrine in place and then having the training developed that reflects the doctrine. So that's what we did earlier this year. We got about 14 of our driving experts around a table and we looked at the doctrine in the first instance, which was really important for us. Now that's in the stages of completion. In fact, if I recall correctly, there's a couple of workshops uh, for the driver cohort to get together either this week or next week uh, with Rowan Gordon responsible for the operational doctrinal piece. From there, we'll make sure that the final pieces of the puzzle is put into place for, for driver, uh, drive, operate, drive vehicles under operational conditions is actually the course that you're referring to there. So there's a couple of components that have been finalised, but the policy and legislation component has not yet been finalised and we're working on that. As far as off-road goes, I think we have to start distinguishing between skills acquisition and skills maintenance. And I think a lot of the conversations around driving currently rests on how can I make sure that those people who have done a course can actually maintain those skills or refresh those skills or have some professional development. So the team knows that this is a current priority. Uh, all of the other deputies, uh, Rowan sitting next to me, indicated to me that that is a primary priority for us right now. I do just want to put it in perspective and say, folks, we've got three driver instructors and then we have all of our driver educators. So we are working as a cohort on those particular um, units to try and make sure that we can get them across the line for you. Um, just as far as off-road, sorry, but there's a fair bit of information in that question. As far as off-road goes, it is important to note that those three units, particularly in relation to heavy vehicles, is actually not part of the public safety training package. They are part of transport and logistics. So transport and, and logistics training package has just been updated and those units have just become superseded on the 24th of October this year, which means again a transition process for us. The difference here is that it was done by transport and logistics, not by public safety. So we will have to ensure that our training packages now comply with those heavy vehicle units that have been reviewed by other partners, not ourselves. Absolutely, so let's talk about um, you know, RTO, let's talk about training packages and that sort mm. of stuff, because I'm, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting the buy through the <laughs> chat. You know, obviously our members are very passionate about training and, yes. and you know, they're, they're just not happy at the moment. And we've heard that, um, we've heard that loud and clear. Mm. And we're really trying to, as I said, unscramble a lot of things that have been happening over uh, many, 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 many years. Mm. Uh, a, we have changes externally uh, imposed upon CFA, uh, but also, I guess, some changes within CFA that were made with the best intentions at the time, but ultimately have had unintended consequences now that we've gotten further down uh, down the track. But um, So we had a, a workshop last Friday with the, with the Deputy Chiefs and yourself. Uh, we came in and, and we, uh, we asked ourselves, so there's 200 units uh, on, our, on our scope, absolutely mammoth, like there, there wouldn't be too many other RTOs in the country that, um, that has that size of scope. Mm. And that adds to the issue because every single one of those packages needs to be updated, benchmarked, 
you know, rejig to ensure that it's compliant with uh, the VRQA standards, but also you know, aligned to the public safety training package. So uh, myself and the deputies asked, I guess, yourself the question, why are we delivering uh, public safety training packages for everything that we do, or can we just take a reasonably and practical approach to introducing enterprise training packages and skills packs? Um, so we've had that conversation. Uh, so talk us through, I guess, what your thinking are, what your thinking is in this space, and how you foresee our scope looking into the future, but also getting that mix right between <coughs> using the public safety training package competencies and you know, complying with all the requirements of the VRQA and co, uh, versus having an enterprise training package delivered and certified internally within mm. CFA. Mm. Thank you, Chief. Look, it's a very good question. And I do just want to say, I've tried to monitor some of the comments coming in here. I think what is important to understand is we that the critical mass of 200 packages is almost too large for us to manage. So I think we all need to take a step back and ask ourselves, what training do we really need to deliver? And what is training that over time people thought might have been a good idea for us to deliver, but, but is actually just not required? Because what it's doing is it's creating a lot of white noise in the system, and that means we're not necessarily always working on the priorities that we should be working on. So one of the exercises that I took the chief and, and the other DCOs through last week was to have a look at our scope of registration and actually talk about what units of competency should we be delivering as enterprise training and what should we be delivering as, as on our scope aligned to national units of, of competencies. And that in fact talks to some of the AFAC working groups that's also currently looking at the scope of registration. So the governance working group there that has many of our volunteers on that working group is also looking at the scope of registration. But I think in general what I'd like to say is training is currently not in the in the space that it could be. There is a lot of room for opportunities here for improvement for us. The truth of the matter is, folks, I only have so much resources to do so much work for you. I'm not in the business of band aiding anything. I've, I've now lived with the CFA for a while, and I think if we now fix anything, we need to fix it to make it future-proof for quite a long period of time. And that's why it's really important for me that we do and undertake the reviews and the development properly I don't overpromise and underdeliver. So when people ask me, will we have all of these training packages ready? My answer is no, we won't. Because we need to do it properly. We need to benchmark it. We need to properly consult it with all of our stakeholders and all of our partners. But what has been important for me is, is that ODNT does not set the priorities. We don't decide what training packages packages we'd like to work on or develop or review. That's normally a conversation that we consult with different groups on. So we consult with the Joint Training Committee, who is a fantastic committee working with us that has many of our volunteer trainers and assessors on that committee. We work with the deputies. We work with the chief. Uh, we generally ask our instructors, our ACFOs as well. And then we also have a look at the RTO Governance Committee. And jointly, they decide what the training priorities are right now that we need to work on. So in summary there, Chief, I just would like to say this. The chances of me being able to develop a training package that every single one of you, 55,000 members, are 100% happy with is probably zero. So I'm trying to work on training packages that meet the requirements of the majority of our volunteers. That, that's where I think we need to focus our attention um, to ensure that we deliver the best possible training that we can. But I do just want to acknowledge that our trainers and assessors do a lot of the heavy lifting. Our instructors do a lot of the heavy lifting. And I know that we've asked for your patience um, in terms of, of training. I hear all day long, I get over 100 emails a day, and, and many of them are people feeling very unhappy and with good reason about the fact that we're not delivering the training packages yet that we could be. But we are working as hard and as fast as we potentially can for you. Yeah, and, and I think that's the... That's the reality, and I know mm. a, lot of our, yeah, a lot of our members know we don't duck the hard questions, no. but we're also not going to um, sit here and, and, and BS our members either, <laughs> is the reality is um, we can't get everything up and running overnight. Uh, there is a, there is a, a, a need to, to do this, and, do, and as you said, um, you know, I've given the instruction about focus on structural training that needs yep. to be delivered. Uh, we've got to focus on, on driving yep. uh, and a focus on, on crew leader and, and, and some of those other, you know, as you say, important courses that 
suit the majority of our members because that's what I'm, you know, I'm hearing when I'm out in the brigades about needing those types of training courses urgently and that's coming through uh, in, the, uh, in the chat here tonight. Uh, one of the things I did want to point out and, and um, a, a comment around, I guess, what are we doing for the rural brigades and yeah, a bit of a thing that we've been talking about urban and structural and standards and that sort of stuff. Um, it, is, it was one of the things out of the AFAC peer review, and I know, uh, Jen, you've, you, you and the team are working on a training pathway, and part of that training pathway is fundamentally looking at what are the foundational skills that an individual needs to operate in an environment that is tailored to their brigade's risk environment. So, um, and that is actually meaning that we're looking at uh, a potential where um, you know, GFF is not going to necessarily be the starting point for a lot of our uh, rural brigades. We're actually going to have uh, a, like I said, a different foundational skills mm. package that will be tailored to their to their needs. Did you want to sort of, I guess, like touch on yes. where, we're, where we're thinking? Obviously, a lot of consultation. <laughs> uh, we will need to involve the VFBB and talk to our members. But I guess um, what I am signalling tonight uh, and what we have been asked for is, you know, GFF, we've heard loud and clear, it's, it's working for some, it's not working for all, and particularly those brigades in real, you know, rural areas, in the Wimmera, um, Mallee, those sort of places. Um, we, are, we have listened and we're working on, uh, I guess, a, a foundational skills package, aren't we? We certainly are, Chief. So I just want to give a quick shout out here to the AFAC Training Pathway Working Group, who's done a huge amount of work on the draft training pathways, which we currently have. Um, and I think it's really important just to understand that we've had a lot of different opinions on having a foundation sort of set of, of skills as opposed to the GFF. There's a lot of different views around it. There's a cohort of people that feel very strongly that we should have that. There's a cohort of people that feel very strongly that we shouldn't do that. And at this point in time, we, we're busy with our consultation. So in fact, last week, Sunday, we spent the day with the, the Joint Training Committee and we had lots of really robust discussions about whether we should or should not have that. So we're in the midst of consultations and on the 10th of December, we've got the Project Control Board meeting where the volunteers responsible for the Training Pathway Working Group will actually present mm -hmm. their views to the Project Control Board in as far as that particular classification goes. Yep. So, a lot of, again, a lot of discussion, a lot of conversation here around the need for uh, greater communication out to, out to the membership about what's happening with training. And that's why we've dedicated tonight uh, as, a, as a first, you know, specifically on, mm. on training matters. But um, I know you, we have been talking and you're looking at how best to try and communicate with our membership where things are up to uh, with training, about where packages are at, where, uh, where you know, AFAC Peer review stuff is out in the light. It's a bit of a challenge for us, isn't it? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we we get criticised sometimes for for ten, sending too much information out, and uh, and likewise we get uh, the opposite in terms of, of not enough. But again, want to assure our members, uh, it is very much uh, front of mind for us mm -hmm. uh, in how we can present that information out to our our membership, because uh, we acknowledge that um, you know districts can't get to all brigades all the time. Uh, and yeah, we need to think of that a medium to be able to allow people to uh, to get that update, whether it be members online or a regular update. Or I'm actually thinking, Jean, we probably need training to be a, a bit of a regular, you know, forum agenda forum. item. <laughs> uh, again, for you to be able to give uh, an update on where things are, uh, where things are at. So, in fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight I will give you my commitment. Uh, every month we'll have a video of Jean providing you an update of training and where things are up to uh, with uh, the training environment uh, to obviously keep the lines of communication uh, open. You mentioned before uh, we have gone through an audit, uh, a VRQA audit, uh, looking at um, the CFA RTO and, and how we went. And uh, tonight we have uh, Kirsty War, our, our Manager of Governance, uh, who uh, has put together a bit of a package for us telling us about uh, the CFA's VRQA audit and, uh, and some information around uh, the outcomes of that. So over to you, Kirsty. Hi, I'm Kirsty, Manager of Quality and Evaluation in the CFA Operational Doctrine and Training Team. My role is to ensure compliance to standards as a registered training organisation. As an RTO, CFA is bound to comply with regulations that ensure quality training delivery. The question I get asked most is why are we an RTO? I want to answer that by saying there are three very good reasons for CFA to continue being an RTO. Training is being delivered to an agreed industry standard. 
It allows our members to work alongside other public safety agencies or across borders, which means we're interoperable. And finally, it allows us to align with the vision of the CFA board of a highly skilled operational response agency. We know that sometimes there's a different point of view because when you train to a national standard, you must comply with that standard. Still, ultimately, we think it's vital for us to maintain focus on high quality industry standard training. We know our members are highly skilled, but we can only make that claim with a standard indicating that they've met it. Our ability as an RTO to train to a nationally recognised standard means that we can objectively say to the Victorian community, you are in the hands of true professionals. CFA must re-register as an RTO every five years. I'm proud to say we recently had our re-registration audit, which highlighted some opportunities for improvement. The teams across CFA are working through a plan to action the recommendations. This work aims to contribute to quality training delivery and we hope to have it finalised by mid-December. I would like to shout out to three key ODT partners without whom we couldn't deliver any training. The first goes out to our colleagues in the regions, the MLDs, Leeds, CLDs and ALDs. The second group I'd like to recognise are the instructors who bring operational experience into courses, allowing us to present high quality practical training. And finally, to our trainers and assessors who give up their time to train new members and upskill others within their brigades. Without you, we cannot do this. I want to leave you all with a reminder that the CFA RTO doesn't start and end at head office. It's a team sport. We're all in this together. And on behalf of CFA training, we are excited to continue to deliver quality training across the state and ensure that it is fun, engaging and a positive experience for all. Back to you, Jason. Thank you, Kirsty, for that information on an update on the uh, VRQA audit. Uh, just, a, I guess, a quick observation and picking up on a comment, and thanks for the observation in the uh, chat this evening. Uh, I guess making the comment that we've only got 250 people watching live this evening. That is right. Generally, uh, over the course of, uh, of the producing the volunteer forum uh, live on the evening, we generally have anything between uh, 250 to 300, 400 people watching, including those in our live audience. What I take away and what's great to see is by the end of the week, uh, people get access to it and we generally have about two to 3,000 people uh, watch the volunteer forum in the days preceding the live broadcast. So uh, thank you very much for, for the observation this evening, but we are, we know we are getting uh, lots of people watching it and we want lots of people to, to share uh, our live forums because that's how we, we want to you know, uh, answer the questions of our, of our members and provide them with uh, relevant updates. So we just saw uh, Kirsty talk about the, uh, about the audit. Yes. Um, any, I guess, thoughts or final words on, <laughs> on the audit and where we're at? Thank you, Chief. Um, so the, the VRQA conducted its re-registration audit, which is just normal general practice after some years. Um, we had the auditor, it was a very good auditor, um, and we've received the final audit report. General practice is that any organisation has about 28 days to have a look at addressing some of those action items that flows from the audit. So in the audit itself, there were very little surprises for us. We, we knew going in together with our, our, our members um, our regional partners, I should say, the MLDs, the CLDs and the leads and so forth. Um, we spoke to them as our partners and, and I don't think any of those items that were raised were a surprise to us. So currently, um, Kirsty as well as the MLDs are working tirelessly towards the 15th of December. That's actually our deadline date to ensure that we've made the rectifications that the VOKA has asked for. Um, on a side note, we were very grateful that it came in before Christmas which means hopefully both the MLDs and their teams and, and Kirstie's team can have a bit of a rest then. But a lot of work happening in the background right now to ensure that those rectifications are made. Awesome. Uh, and again, picking up in the chat, a lot of comment around, I guess, some of the issues that people have found within training packages and, and discrepancies and the like. I do encourage you, uh, either you know, raise those with your MLD, mm -hmm. your CLD, uh, and if, if all else fails, again, uh, I know your inbox is full already, <laughs> but training at CFA. Because if we don't know about these things, we can't fix them. Uh, and we, we absolutely, we, we want and need to get training right 
for our members. So we, we, we encourage people to, uh, to let us know what's going on there. Uh, we have a question from our, our live audience and we've got Peter from Dalesford. Over to you, Peter. Uh, question for um, again. You mentioned before about the wording of the training packages changing mm -hmm. to a must. How's that going to affect people that have already got those qualifications? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that, that's a really good question. It doesn't affect people who've already got a qualification. So I think that the important thing to remind yourself here of is once you've attained a competency, you've attained it. It's yours forever. No one can take it away. It's yours. You get to use it. But for any new members that we need to train in those training packages, likely what we will see from a practical point of view is that some of those courses will be slightly longer. Because if there's more material written into those units of competencies, it generally affects the numbers of hours that we need to train in. So please, for all of the members who already have those particular units of competencies, there is absolutely nothing there to be concerned about or worry about. Although, if we have any members who would like to transition to PUA 19, we can certainly have a look at GAP training to make sure that most of our members have the most up-to-date unit of competency that they can possibly hold. Mm. But a really good question, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Peter, a fantastic question. Um, I got, a, I guess, a, a comment here from, uh, from Chris and uh, probably to yourself, Ian and, um, and Bill. Yeah, a quick shout out to the trainers. You do a great job. It's a tough gig and a lot of pressure and the effort that they put in some is amazing. A couple in particular go above, uh, go well above and beyond. Good job. So uh, well done. And because uh, it is, it is a bit tough, isn't it? Because your volunteer availability means that training is typically mm. out of hours uh, yes. and well into the evening. And I know, uh, Crosby, you do a lot of uh, evening work at, at the training yes. at Central Highlands yep. as well. And, um, yeah, it is, it is a bit tough sometimes, isn't it? It is. And what we also have to recognise is our, our trainers and assessors, assessors that are volunteers, um, if you look at their commitments outside of their training and assessing role, most of them are usually high up in the BMT or the group management team. So we've, a number of our trainers are lieutenants, captains, deputy group officers. So we're very cautious about overburdening them with training. So to hear that response mm. from one of the members is very heartwarming, so thank you. Oh, mm. Fantastic, and I think I'd just like something. to add, Chief, too, that uh, while there's a bit of a workload to it, what we do is more than uh, made easy by the, the uh, learning development teams within regions. They do all, put all the packages together, so we just, and I'm not sure if we, we get the kits and deliver yeah. them, but without that support and, and backup, it make our job so much uh, so much harder. And, and look, there's no denying mm. people are frustrated. So yeah. you know, it's not about singing all rainbows and lollipops. No. I was one of them. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, there are yeah, yeah th 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 we are working through some, mm. some challenges and issues. And Jean's outlined those, and we'll continue to to, yep. to provide updates to our members on that. Um, but I, what amazed me when I first come uh, into uh, into CFA, and in fact, uh, in a couple of days' time, nine days' time, in fact, um, would be. Uh, six days time, so that couldn't count, um, <laughs> will be my second year uh, anniversary yeah. here with, with CFA, yeah. um, is the amazing a, uh, you know, props, facilities uh, that our, um, our volunteers mm. can get access mm. to and the, the quality of the instructors, yep. um, particularly you know, Central Highlands and the other, mm. other campuses and our mobile props and, uh, and the like. Um, how, how, what's your experience with, with using those facilities and getting volunteers to, to train in them? Um, I guess we're very lucky with the, the newest in the state here in Milan and to have that you know, world, class, or world class facility and it's literally at our doorstep. So uh, District 15 Barrett area, we are very, very lucky. And I know that the calendar is pretty full that, uh, that the, the development team are really Sort of trying to as much as they can, so it's uh, we're very lucky to have that support and, and the ability to train with the, with the best of what we've got. Absolutely, um, yeah, Rowan, you've got a, a Vemtech facility in your uh, in your region. Um, it'd be pretty great to have that asset. Uh, absolutely. So we've got Penshurst, uh, which is down near Hamilton, so uh, in District Five. Um, Penshurst, small team running that through. So Darren and the team. Uh, doing a fantastic job. And if I think about the improvements at Penshurst in the last couple of years, particularly around you know, catchment of water, but also you know, the hard standing, um, you know, the pad, the, the props that are used, 
you know, it's not quite the Central Highlands, but I have to say the effort and the teamwork and the, um, uh, the passion that goes into that training ground alone um, puts it on a par with any other one. And I know the, the level of pride uh, from the team down there is fantastic. I was lucky enough to go down there with uh, Paul Ramage's team. So part of my leadership team uh, took half a day down there with, um, with Paul's team and we got on the pad and not quite as agile as we used to be and, <laughs> and as active, but just to be able to um, bring anyone in from any level, just to do basic firefighter training is, is just fantastic. And the more we can use those facilities, the better. Mm -hmm. um, another great co uh, question in here and some commentary around um, yeah, courses and training of courses. And uh, I guess a, a, a question here, a comment more so about certain brigades being restricted or you know, from their, their opinion is restricted um, uh, from doing certain training courses due to their brigade classification. What's your experience with that? Uh, so, you know, we've probably heard tonight how sought after training is. Um, we do need to focus on training against the skills mix or the community risk that uh, sits within an area and understanding that brigades cross over and you know, there's some cross pollination of risk across brigade boundaries, but um, the focus is to ensure that we're getting the brigades that respond to that risk to the appropriate training, which unfortunately means that um, some brigades sitting in a lower risk or not in that profile may not get that opportunity to, uh, to do that training. And that may extend to also, I know a lot of conversation uh, in the chat around low voltage fuse removal and the fact that it can't be found on the learning hub and it's, it's happening out there. Talk us through, I guess, how low voltage fuse removal came to be and why uh, the training has been rolled out the way that it is. Yeah, so, so low voltage fuse removal uh, was an adoption or adaptation, I suppose, of um, previous training that was provided. So we had a, a bit of a gap in low voltage fuse removal training uh, with some change in regulations, I believe. Uh, a package was put together and that's rolled out through the safety compliance uh, training. So the work that Gary Cook's team leads, um, supported by Jean's team, uh, they've rolled out training based on the risk uh, of community. So not every brigade, uh, oh, sorry, we can't roll the, the gear and equipment and training out to every brigade. So uh, there's a mosaic of brigades that have that skill. When the brigades put their hand up and accept and through conversations with the district have been identified, um, they provided the training. I think we need three, at least three members per brigade to then roll out the equipment for that brigade. So it's no longer just, you know, go and get the equipment, we'll give you the training. It's a bit more of a um, consolidated package of uh, equipment, training and the right um, risk environment. Absolutely. Um, a, lot of, a lot of conversation again in here around um, access to training, knowing when training courses are on and the like. Uh, and, and, I, and I've got to say some pretty good observations from my perspective anyway, um, around the need or why do I need to go to multiple areas in the organisation to seek training and get, uh, and get approval for training. And they're not talking about region and, and ODT, it's more of you know, other functional areas within, within the organisation. Uh, as well, and one of the one of the things that we have done recently is um, moved where LMS is is sitting, um, and LMS really needs to be our one stop shop uh, for understanding tr you know training and development, no matter what it is, uh, booking and enrolling. So we've took some opportunity to uh, sit with Kay Pawsey, the manager of our learning and management system, uh, as well as Brendan O'Kane, our chief information officer, to talk about the movement of LMS out of training and into uh, ICT. And I'll throw to Brendan and Kay now to talk about uh, what that means for us. Thanks, Chief. Yes, we, we've brought the learning hub and the learning management system into ICT and we're helping to, to drive some improvements in that. The key things really is to, to make it user friendly, easier for the, for the volunteers and the members to use and to get more out of it. Um, Kay and her team have come across in, into ICT and uh, are leveraging off the other people we have in the team. And how are you finding the move, Kay? Oh, it's really great. A lot of support from the uh, other members in ICT, so that's been really fantastic. Um, and the ability to you know, start working on some real innovations in the LMS, um, connecting it up with other systems, so that'll be really exciting. And what are, what are the key areas, key improvements that, that people will notice as we move forward? We're working on a, a number of initiatives. One of those would be uh, looking at the first aid space, so we know that we've shifted vendors, 
And in that shift, we've got a little bit of a backlog on the entry of the, the data from the new vendor. So we are looking at making a direct connection with the vendor so that those uh, changes will be made in real time. When people complete training and are signed off with the vendor, then that would be sent across to the LMS. So that's one exciting thing. And I think the other thing we're looking at is online assessment. So looking at opportunities to uh, leverage the LMS to create some of uh, the assessment online uh, so that people can complete that in the classroom, um, at least to begin with. So that's very exciting and we're working with IDT on that. And it really is about making the Learning Hub and the LMS easier to use, isn't it? Simplifying it, but also more efficient so that the, the data and the assessments flow straight through, it's up on the records and, and, and people have got access to it quicker. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I think that we, you know, we're, we're sort of working also on making it more user friendly um, in the sense that we're looking at a, an update perhaps to the, the software to, um, to a little bit more of a modern look. And we are also working on uh, having some sessions that we're running for the BMTs and GMTs because we know that um, there's often a lot of change in that space. Just um, some virtual sessions, you can jump onto the Learning Hub and book in for um, a session where we will run through the system and how to put in drills, how to look at records um, for your members and just to make it a little bit easier for people to navigate around the system. Yeah, and by being virtual sessions, they can get on any time, do it, do it at a time that suits them. So again, and, and working with the rest of the, the ICT team to, to have that user interface, the user experience, a, a lot more friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks, Kay. Welcome to the team. Thank and, you very uh, much. Yeah, we look forward to, to driving the Learning Hub forward for, for all our members. Very exciting. Thank you. Back to you, Chief. Thank you, Kay, and thank you, Brendan, for that update on uh, the learning management system. Um, again, uh, videos triggered a lot of conversation, a lot of commentary around uh, the learning management system, and uh, we know it is a frustration for people uh, as well, particularly around user intuitiveness and the rest of it. I know uh, our Chief Information Officer is very big on the user experience, um, and so you know, I know there's going to be a lot of work done on that uh, LMS system to make sure that it meets our needs mm. uh, today and well into the future, So, uh, which is fantastic, uh, great to see. Um, gentlemen, how has training evolved, I guess, uh, from the time when you first walked into your first CFA station? I guess for me, uh, it was pretty much on the job training. I joined up, I joined in 1982. Uh, and it was yeah, pretty much rock up the station, sign up, here's, here's a pair of overalls and yeah, good luck to you. So uh, uh, it was pretty rudimentary, uh, but today, and, and I, uh, I note the comments about the, uh, the, the frustrations of what's going on, and as Jean quite rightly said, there's a lot of packages there to deliver, um, but from, from myself as, a, as a, both a volunteer and a, and a trainer assessor, uh, I'd much rather have this level of detail and, and skills to know that we've been trained to the best of our ability. Absolutely. Yep. So, because um, I guess the reality is, and, and you know, we probably do need to get a little bit sombre for a minute, is uh, there's been a few watershed mm. moments uh, in this state mm. uh, involving CFA members that has led to a couple of key decisions being made mm. around yep. training, yep. and one of which uh, was the tragedy at, at Linton. Linton. Yes, um, definitely. Yeah, Ian, your thoughts to, to that? Um, Linton actually occurred about 10 years after I joined and um, I, I remember vividly uh, being in my uncle's uh, kitchen. He was the group communications officer out at Bunanyong and we were listening to the fire. We never thank thankfully heard the tragedy, but um, I'm, I'm a very much similar story to Bill. I got handed a pair of overalls had to buy my own boots. <laughs> I did get a helmet that was second hand and it was, it was all on the job training. Um, and probably another watershed moment for myself was actually seeing the result of the Linton tragedy when I was on recruits in 2001 down at, um, down at the Boland facility. And if anyone wants to argue about training and the level of training and things like GFF, um, if you ever saw that, the result of that, then you wouldn't even question it. Absolutely, and um, but it's not only uh, Linton, and, and we saw last fire season 
uh, a tragic accident in South mm. Australia. In fact, uh, with our very own CFA members, uh, in fact, one of our members was a sector commander during that yeah, that tragic time uh, involving you know, a tree. And mm. unfortunately, uh, trees you know, are a major hazard for our firefighters and again led to uh, tree hazard mm. awareness. Um, yeah, I guess, what's your thoughts to why it's important that we do these things? Oh, look, for the safety of our people is the first part. You know, the, the, the feeling, the pain that comes with, you know, notifying, being with the family members and trying to explain or rationalise what occurred um, is extremely difficult, but we can't bring those people back. So I know that, you know, there are different challenges in training and people have different opinions of how far we need to train and what do we need to do. But I can say the family members that I've spoken to post Linton, and I've got to know some of the family members, uh, as I'm in South West, uh, their comments around training and the need to make sure people are skilled up uh, is extremely evident. And, you know, it'd be nice if we could turn back time and, and you know, have them with us today, but we can't. And the message I get from the family is if there's a legacy that comes from their passing, it is that we are a better place to protect our people. Mm. And I know, um, yeah, for myself personally, uh, it is, to be frank, quite gut-wrenching mm. uh, every year at our firefighters' memorial to be able to, to have to stand up uh, and read the names of every CFA member who has died in the line of duty. Mm. And to be quite frank, there is just too many of them. And uh, I, I'm yet to, to make it through without, you know, having that realisation within yeah. myself and having that emotional reaction mm. to, you know, here's a, 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 a pages and pages uh, of members who, um, you know, have, have died in the line of duty and sacrificed to their, uh, to their community. So if training is one of the things that we can do mm. to, to ensure that our members get home uh, to your family and friends, then, you know, I am personally uh, all for it. And that's the reason why we have the Chief mm. Officer's uh, yeah. minimum requirements. Uh, we have Peter back from uh, Dalesford that also wants to share on a, on a reflection and thoughts. Thank you. Um, Linton is a very good uh, segue into what I wanted to say. Uh, I joined in 1984, came to this district... Uh, no, sorry, I joined in 1980, came to this district in 1985. I was at Linton. Uh, I'd been a training officer prior to that in a brigade as a volunteer, and I picked up a job in training in this district post Linton as a result of the Linton inquest. I worked with the, uh, the volunteers that went down to the uh, inquest. I uh, did that as a, a, in a volunteer role and was passionate about training when we, we went from two people to 16 people in this district in training across 15, 16 and 17. Mm. That passion over the years was lost uh, and uh, I decided I needed to get out of training. So 13 years after that, I left training, went to community safety on this economy. When I had to go back to training, I quit because I didn't think I could cope with not being able to support the volunteers. Mm. I attended the session at Vemtech that Bill spoke about earlier and my passion was renewed because mm. the new people in training that are doing the roles now have that passion and they are volunteer focused. So hopefully that gives hope to the people that are out there and that are looking at training and looking at becoming trainer assessors. And um, I wish them luck. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for your thoughts, Peter, and sharing those insights. It's uh, very valuable to, to hear from you, and I guess that I hear that passion in, uh, in your voice. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got the same passion for um, community education as well. I'm absolutely. And, and there's been a lot of discussion in the chat tonight around the importance of community mm. uh, engagement and education. In fact, I was with our, our community engagement teams earlier on in the week where yeah, I emphatically said to them that yeah, community education and community engagement is just as important as operations. In fact, it's part of operations. Why? Because it's about firefighter safety, whether that be making sure that a development application meets uh, code and requirements, whether it be you know, educating mm. people to prepare their homes, to have that defendable <coughs> space yep. uh, for firefighters, or even uh, having them the awareness to, to know what to do, have that bushfire survival plan 
uh, in event of a fire so that, uh, again, when firefighters turn up, uh, they can do what they do, uh, knowing that the, 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 the occupants of the home uh, are well looked after and taken care of. So thank you very much for sharing your insights this evening. I know community safety works, community safety um, programs work, because after the Scotsman fire, both Heather and myself have had people come to us and say, we did what you said, and that's the only reason we survived. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Very valuable. Thank you very much for, for your insights there. It's very valuable and uh, uh, a lot of people online have uh, appreciated your thoughts, feelings and comments around that. So thank you for, uh, for sharing uh, this evening. Um, we touched on the Central Highlands facility and some mm -hmm. of the great uh, campuses that we do have uh, around uh, the state and we're, we're investing constantly in those and particularly around environmental compliance, water management and those sort of things. Uh, but there are other uh, technologies that we're also uh, embarking upon in training and one of those is virtual reality. I know many of our members may have seen the virtual reality equipment uh, at Marupna during the, the last two state championships. Uh, can you tell me more, Jean, around how virtual reality can be used in skills um, mm. you know, maintenance acquisition and the like? Thank you, Chief. Um, virtual reality is a very important mechanism to train people in almost a simulated real life scenario, but at the same time not expose them to any risk, which I think is very important. So we certainly, we've got XVR um, that Paul Cockrell is, is currently rolling out for us, and we've got the Flame virtual reality equipment that Chris Taylor is working with as well. And I know that the brigades often book time with those two individuals to, to roll out those sort of digital components to our members. I just wanted to, if I may, just quickly reflect on some of the comments around Linton and, and the comments that Peter made. And I just wanted to say that that's why I'm in training, personally. That's why I'm not band-aiding anything because I have in previous roles had similar experiences mm -hmm. where I talk to family members where their loved ones have passed. And they talk to me about the fact that they will accept nothing less than the best standard of training. So I actually hold that responsibility very dear to my heart and so does my team. So we might be a little bit slow folks in rolling things out, but we're taking this very seriously. So Peter, can I just say thank you for your commitment in coming back you know, one of the audit findings was not that we had low quality training. The, one of the audit findings was high quality training with some non-compliances. And I think that says everything about our instructors and our trainers and our volunteers. Um, those volunteer trainers and assessors and the instructors, the experience that they have and the added level of, of you know, training that they bring to the training packages that we put together, that is actually where the quality training comes from. And I do just want to advocate and say education and training is a team sport. We can do as much as we want within ODNT, but without our colleagues, um, our MLDs, the CLDs, the leads, without our trainers and assessors, without our instructors, without the PAD staff operating the Vemtex, without any one of those pieces. Okay, training officers. Ex exactly, training falls down. So I view this as a team sport, and that's why I'm so keen to do proper consultations with everybody who matters in this pipeline of training. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. And uh, we have Kayla here from, uh, from Dalesford, and I know we see Kayla a bit on some of our uh, <laughs> CFA uh, you know, promotional videos and, and the like. So thanks for, for popping up, Kayla, and you're going to share an insight for us. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> Kayla's got dobbed in on it. But um, I just wanted to say that I'm currently training to be a trainer assessor and I was kind of just told to give my view on it and um, I was highly encouraged to join, especially by Cros, kind of pushed me off the deep end into it. But um, the best thing about learning to be a trainer assessor so far, getting out of the school space, just getting to meet all our volunteers. I'm told to be, I know a bit, but I don't know as much as everyone on the ground because we all know different things and we all learn from each other. I can go to a training, a skills maintenance day or a training day and teach someone, but I don't walk, I don't walk in there knowing everything because I will walk away learning just as much as what they all learn. That's the best thing about our trainer and assessors. No one's the big top gun because we all walk away learning because in this job, we never stop learning. So, yeah, awesome. pretty awesome. 
awesome. And, and I guess, Ian, no, no truer word has Absolutely. been, has yep. been spoken. Cool. And uh, how proud yeah. is it for you to see Kayla standing up there? Absolutely uh, awesome. Having a go. Absolutely awesome. And, and to, I, I can only echo what Kayla said. Um, and for all of our trainer assessors that have given up their time, I'm proud of every one of them because they make our job a heck of a lot easier. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and you must meet some fantastic oh. people. Uh, I know I meet some fantastic people when I you know, travel the state talking to brigades and meeting members, but as a, as a, you know, as a trainer and assessors, as a, an upcoming training and assessor, you must, uh, you must meet some fantastic people. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> and one of my, um, my key introductory um, statements is if you're not here to have fun, then you need to leave because it's the only thing we've got. We're not paying the people to be there. If they don't come and enjoy the training and get involved and want to come back and do more training, then we're not doing our job. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your insights, uh, Kayla, and sharing your story. And uh, good luck and um, yeah, keep it up. It's a fantastic job and uh, it's great to see you going well. Thank you. Wow. You also learned some pretty bad jokes along the way. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that's that from Angus. Your, are they Angus. your jokes or no. uh, someone else's? No, Angus, my colleague, and bad jokes. Uh, very good. Very good. No, congratulations and, uh, and well said, Kayla, and thank you for, for your insights there. Because, you know, um, members like Kayla, they are our future. Correct. Uh, really, aren't they, in terms of uh, identifying enthusiastic young members who want to get involved uh, and want to, to make a difference in uh, in this CFA, which is which is all about them. So thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is uh, so much happening on in the chat that I know uh, many of the team, the ODT gene, the team, Gene, they have been, their fingers must be uh, almost <laughs> to the bone or smoke coming off their keyboards, uh, have been frantically trying to answer some of the questions uh, online. Uh, particularly the ones that I haven't managed to uh, to get to. So thank you and a big shout out to our ODT team. Uh, as we said, I think we'll, we'll do a monthly uh, update. I know, um, yeah, because it is important to us and we need to, to make sure that our membership feel that they are um, you know, informed uh, and, uh, and, and understand what's happening in, uh, in the training space. A uh, couple of things for me that uh, I guess to touch on just in, in closing some general updates. Um, uh, just a general reminder to our brigades across the state that your Regulation 61 uh, financial return is due uh, into the CFA by the end of December. So uh, it's just a, a friendly reminder from your uh, kind folks at the Finance Department. Uh, and I'm sure our uh, RFOBs will be in contact with brigades that, uh, that are yet to do that. But uh, just a gentle reminder uh, there. And likewise, today, we, Natalie and myself shot out uh, some information about the opening of the online claim uh, form process for volunteer reimbursements where you've incurred uh, costs associated with deploying uh, to the Victorian flood emergency. So uh, if you have uh, incurred costs uh, whilst being deployed uh, out of your pocket, you are eligible for uh, a, a reimbursement from the Victorian government. The information will be uh, available on uh, the members online portal uh, as of tomorrow. Uh, and I encourage members to get online and understand and have a look at that. Uh, details are being provided. So uh, just a shout out for, for our members and, uh, and for those that have, as I said, incurred those costs. Because mm -hmm. uh, we understand volunteering at time does come at personal sacrifice, not only in time, but also in cost. And, uh, and this is something that I guess we try and do to alleviate uh, some of those costs associated with the deployments. And I know many volunteers have been on three or four tours of duty. So um, thank you for those members. And Bill, I hear you've got a bit of a shout out too. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll give the brigade a bit of a plug here for uh, the um, Barrett Heritage Week uh, in May. Uh, the station will be open, have opened in the past, and I'm sure it will be this year too, that the uh, brigade will be open for tours and the like. So if anyone's interested in the Dodge or all the magnificent trophies you've got here, that uh, jump online, have a look for the Barrett, Histori uh, Barrett uh, Heritage Festival, uh, and they can pop in and, and visit the station. Thanks, Chief. No, thank you. And a big thank you once more to Mark and the uh, gang here at Ballarat for allowing us to uh, invade their station uh, so we can come into you uh, wherever you be uh, across the, the globe or in your living room or wherever uh, your brigade station to watch uh, the volunteer forum. So thank you, uh, Mark, and thank you to the team. Uh, here at Ballarat. A big shout out and thanks to those online uh, from CFA Management again that have been there to answer your questions 
Uh, so I very much appreciate uh, for that. And thank you to the panel, uh, Rowan, uh, Jean, yeah. Ian, Bill, for taking Thanks. your time yep. out uh, this evening. It hasn't been an easy one, I, I will be honest. There's some pretty hard hitting questions in there and we've, we've touched on some pretty hard hitting topics, but uh, as we've always said, we won't dodge the hard questions uh, on uh, the volunteer forum where we can, and there's been so many uh, tonight, it's not funny, mm. um, but I think it's really important. And I, I have to stress uh, that if you do have concerns, if you do pick up those mm. issues or whatever, please talk to uh, your CLD, your MLD, yes. or, or, or uh, contact training at training at cfa.vic.gov.au. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Jean, over to you, I guess, uh, for any final thoughts on this evening's subject material. I think as a final thought, uh, just for all of our members out there, um, training is so important. We can't turn out operationally if we haven't been trained properly. Um, we'd like to work with you on this. We understand the frustration, but the team is ready and willing to work as hard as we possibly can. And I do want to just reiterate that comment that training is a bit of a team sport. We cannot do this without our regional partners. Mm. We cannot do this definitely without our, our educators, and that includes both our trainers and uh, and assessors and our instructors. We cannot do that um, without our PAD staff. So there's so many different moving parts to this. And to each and every one of those folks, a, a very big shout out, particularly those folks who deliver the training and provide that additional quality sort of mechanism to it. We, we cannot tell you how grateful we are. So please bear with us, we will get there. We don't give up easily in ODNT, um, so we're in it for the long run. Thank Absolutely. you, Chief. No, thank you, thank you, Jean. Uh, and once again, a big thank you to those behind the camera, uh, Martin, Naomi, and I call him my executive producer, Brad Thomas, <laughs> uh, that pulls this together every month. He, he loves it, well, secretly hates it when I say that. Uh, but the, the comms team do a fantastic job uh, pulling this together and making sure that we're able to produce uh, a great product, uh, again, so that we can uh, talk to our membership uh, and uh, in a two-way interactive session. So again, thank you very much, team, uh, for your efforts this evening. It's greatly appreciated. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, November's volunteer forum. Uh, we will be scheduling uh, a volunteer forum in December. We'll uh, let you know what, uh, what the dates are. Uh, so uh, obviously we've got Christmas and a few other things coming up, so we'll need to, to, to pick an appropriate time. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you again to the panel. Thank you to the live audience. And thank you to you uh, that have taken the time to tune in and watch uh, this month's volunteer forum. Have a good evening. <laughs>